<clears throat> All right, guys, I'm back. I'm sorry. I had to stop. All right, where was I at? Let me look at my audio real, real quick right here. All right, I know where I'm at. Melon heads next and the melon head batch. Sawmill City Road. That's what we're doing next. Sawmill City, mother lover, mother lover. All right, our next story is Sawmill City Road. In Connecticut. The Melon Heads of Connecticut. Every New England town can claim a ghost and may have a witch in their past. But these same melon heads belong to the own belong to only a handful oh handful of places in the southwestern in southwestern Connecticut. The melon heads live on the uh, outskirts of town on heavily wooded country roads known as Melonhead Roads. Zion Hill Road, for example, is Milford's Melonhead Road. Sawmill City Road is Shelton's. The Melonheads also supposedly live on the outskirts of Monroe, Stratford, Seymour, Weston, Easton, Oxford, Southbury, Fairfield, New Haven, and uh, Trubute. Trubu. They look, they look like small. They look like small, small horrendous beings with oversized heads. And I think this is a real disease at one time it was or something, but that mother the guys really have melon heads. Go check it out. This isn't a ridiculous story. Okay, they look like I got there. Small, they really come out from okay. Oversized melon heads, and they rarely come out from hiding. They survive by eating small animals, stray cats, and human flesh. Usually the flesh of teenagers. And for runaway teens or hitchhikers who disappear, the melon heads serve as a serve as confident explanations. The melon heads. Stories about stories about deformed country people who keep themselves go back at least a century to uh, Europe. For example, a large family of melon heads supposedly once lived in Bavaro, Germany in the mid 19th century. In a bre inbred family of melon heads known as the Weeble Heads. I'm sorry, it's not funny, but it is. Weebles wobble, what they, but they don't fall down. Oh God, just think if you push one of them guys over, they couldn't get up. I'm sorry, I'm going to hell. I just, that's funny. We, uh, they were said to live outside uh, Risbury, England, around 1900. According to another theory, the term melonhead may stem from melanogen, which, dis or which describes mixed-race people in the Appalachians. They had an ancestry of European outcasts for uh, freed slaves and Native Americans, and they keep to them, and they kept to them to themselves. Melonhead stories survived in Connecticut after World War II, a time when people moved away from the cities into the suburbs. They probably reflected the uh, New York ex exurbance, prejudice, and fear of isolated rural folk. But how did the melonheads? end up in Connecticut that's the question that's the story I'm gonna break down once one theory claims that they came from a family accused of witchcraft 
and banished into the wilderness where they survived and uh, of course they were inbred through centuries of inbreeding they um, multiplied into melon heads or mutated into melon heads according to an, another theory the melon heads escaped from the Farfield Hills Hospital a now abandoned mental institute or corner excuse me our corner correctional institute which specifies in inmates with mental health problems before or both are in Newtown Connecticut a ver a variation on that theme as the melon heads ex escaping from an escaping from an unnamed mental institution in the 1960s the building supposedly burned some of the inmates escaped and turned to cannibalism which caused their heads to swell similar melon head stories also uh, surface in ohio and michigan an evil dr crow supposedly conducted experiments on orphans in kirkland ohio the children escaped burned down the orphan the uh, orphanage and retreated into the woods in Michigan, the melon heads were children with hydroxys with hmm. anyways they was abused in an insane asylum in Owato Canal uh, County and eventually released into the woods. Wow. Let me get a drink and we still got more to go. Uh, okay, where was I at? Okay. Now we're going to go over the Blue Grandma. According to legend, back in the 1800s, a group of girls from the... Uh, a group, group of... A, bit, 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 a group of girls from Notre Dame High School in Fairfield decided to drive around after a football football or after a Friday night football game. They peeled into Blue Granada or piled into a where'd it go? Piled into Blue Granada uh, the Blue Granada. It's a car. And ended up on Velvet Street in Tumberville where they looked for the uh, Melonheads. The girls parked the car leaving the headlights on. The they and ventured into the woods after they walked a couple of hundred feet they heard the uh, car door slam then the engine started and the car uh, headed forward or headed or headed towards them they couldn't see uh, see the figures inside the size of the children they had large heads rags for clothes and an orange glow in their eyes <coughs> Some say the melon heads still drive around in that blue Granada. Wow. Others less detailed stories describe mystery figures in the woods. Workers who paved Sawmill City Road in Shelton claim they have heard voices in the woods. Tree, ex tree experts checking the woods for the uh, fungal or fungi or whatever the freak it is investigation thought they saw strange figures lurking in the underbrush reader George Simpson writes that the famous Nike or the famous Nike missile site in the Shelton Monroe area was alleged to be the haunt of the uh, melon heads the legend of the melon heads isn't the only one and only one to involve deformed or mutated humans Connecticut also has the uh, Derby, fo uh, Derby Frog people and the Faceless People of Monroe. So it sounds like Connecticut's got some crazy stuff, I'll tell you. All right, let's get on with our next story, baby. Did y'all like that story of the melon heads? What'd y'all think of the melon heads, man? Pretty crazy shit, huh? 
What if that's true? What if there really are freaking melon heads? I'm sorry about this recording tonight if it turns out being shitty. It just sounds like I'm getting some... I don't know. It just sounds like I'm getting some weird static or something. I don't know. But anyways, our next story we have is the Devil's Washbow. Are y'all ready? I gotta get my music. Excuse me. Okay, our next story is the Devil's Washbow in Vermont. Located on the outskirts of Northfield, the place locals call the Devil's Washbow is a basin shaped terrain of streams and caves full of or full of fallen moss covered rocks. Some people might go there for a hike. Burlington Joe Centro went into a search for Pigman. So you can go here and look for a lot of different things. And just who is the Pigman? His story came to light more than a decade ago when Citro was giving a talk in Northfield. A man by the name of Jeff Hatch stood up to ask if the uh, ask if the local uh, folklores, Arthur of several books and about Vermont legends, had ever heard of a creature that terrorized his high school dance back in 1971. On that memorial night, a group of boys returned from a sand pit adjacent to their cemetery behind the school. Where they, oh, where they stashed some beers, scared and literally crying, recalls Hatch. They were really shook up. The whole group reported having seen a human-like creature, covered in white hair, and white hair bound over the hill, kicking up sand with Hatch. When Hatch and other party goers followed the pack of the pit. Of course, he did not see anything, he says, except for the uh, cloven, cloven marks in the sand. Around this same time, Hatches says people's uh, dogs and cats started coming up missing. One resident of Turkey Hill, a part of Maine Mountain, reported hearing something rattling around in the trash can. According to Hatch, the fellow ex, the, according to Hatch, the fellow the follow ex except to the uh, shoe away raccoons instead when the when the thing stood up it was all white and covered in hair reports gathered by hatch places the creature at somewhere between five foot to five foot or five six foot with a pig-like snout and beady eyes Around the time of the first pigman sightings, rumor has it a fair a fair headed teenage boy disappeared from the Derby Farm in Northfield. Some say the uh, some say he became the pigman. Others that he became pigman's dinner. No one seems to have a name for him. Is pigman a monster? A farm boy gone feral? are a figment of a country folks uh, imagination however his status is reality he is one of the stars of the citrus new book and it's called the vermont monster guide so if you want to check that out go do that all right get ready for our next story We've got two more left All right, I hope y'all are having a good time, a good time in the sunshine. All right, our next story is the Anchor Avenue in Illinois. Oh, crap. 
I never did print that one. Oh well, poop. All right, well we're gonna skip that road and we're gonna do the uh, old Palais Road in Hawaii. Now you you have to go check this out. This used to be a functioning road and I don't see how barely one car could fit on it. So if two lane, if two cars met, they were screwed. But this is the uh, like I said, the old Pali Road in Hawaii. As a state full of uh, history, including wars, royalty, and mythology, there are countless ghosts who have taken up residence among the 1.5 million residents that call the uh, Hawaiian Islands home. These ghosts re reside across the eight main islands. Though nowhere is there a higher consideration of varied ghost stories than along Oyu's beautiful and haunted land. Okay, let's get down to the biscuits and gravy of the story. Alright. There are several legends and tales in paranormal activity near the uh, Pele Highway. There is, one, there is one story more fascinating than the others. It is said that Paul E. and the demon Kaboa, a half man, half pig, had a bad breakup and agreed to never see each other. What the hell? See each other again. Legend has it that they cannot take pork over the Pele Highway because it means that you are taking Kapeas from one side of the island to the other. If you try to bring pork across, your car will stop and some point along the journey an old woman with a dog will appear. Wow. So that's a thing don't like pork there. But man, I thought freaking Hawaii was like the king of king of pork. Because aren't they big time spam eaters? I don't blame them for it. I love me some good spam too. Oh, what do you say here? Dating back to, 19, to 1847, the structure was only used for a few decades before being abandoned and reclaimed by nature. The small single-story three-tiered construction was constructed with Western influence in the, guide and in the guidance of, uh, of Hawaiians. The slightly off-centered windows were... Uh, what the hell? Oh, this is talking about a building that's on there. Okay. Where was I at? The three-tiered windows were built as such to order, order to ward off spirits and night marchers. I'll tell you a story about the night marchers one night from Hawaii. That's a pretty cool story too. Where was I at? Night, uh, the uh, night marchers, who are commonly thought to roam the area near the Pele Lookout. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to visit the ruins and must simply uh, admire the stunning piece of Hawaii history and photographs. Well, that sucks. Yeah, that would be pretty cool to go there and see that. So, I'm sorry I shorted y'all's story this week. I didn't mean to, guys. I'm so sorry. But, I hope you guys have a great night or have a great weekend. Hope you like my stories. They're going to be a lot better and a lot more juicier next week, guys. So, uh, until then, keep being scary, everybody. And it has been Ghost Stories Told from the South with Stephen LeBooth, guys. Thank you for everyone who listens and thank you for the downloads. Keep it up. Leave me some five stars review. Stop. Blah, blah, blah. Five star reviews if you want to. And uh, yeah, man, it'll be great. We'll see you later. Have a good one, man. Bye. And bye to you too, sucker. 
We'll see y'all later. Have a great one, YouTube land. Well, hello, my YouTube fans. Got a good show for you today, baby. Good show. Ah, yeah, got off of work today. Finished getting everything ready. It's night time. I figured, what the hell? I gotta do something real quick. I forgot about the kitty cat. Sorry about that. We got a kitty cat, and when I feed him his uh, soft stuff, I gotta put him in the bathroom and shut the door so the dogs don't get it. But anyways, just want to say thank you guys for liking the podcast and liking my YouTube channel. Keep it up. Keep the likes coming. Keep watching it. Just I love it. I love it. Let's get on with the uh, podcast, guys, and we'll. Uh, Get this mother lover going. Oh, I know what it is. It was that. And, sorry. Making some adjustments on the go. Alright. Get out of there, guys. There's nothing in there for you guys. Alright, well, I'm ready. You're ready. Let's start this sucker. Well, hello. And welcome back. To another, sorry if I'm waving, there's a fly buzzing in my freaking ear. I gotta fuck, uh, I gotta retake that one. Sorry guys, there's a fly buzzing around and right when I started to record. Alright. Yeah, how can I be fucking spooky over here going, Err. No, I'm not waving. It's just, uh, there's a fucking fly bugging around. Alright, let's try it again. Well, hello. And welcome back to another scary, great edition of ghost stories told from the south. I am your host, Stephen Lebooth, and I got some good old stories for you today, my friends. So, if you're looking for something scary to wind down from the day, I've got it for you. Hope everybody's doing great. And welcome back, guys. I'm your host, Stephen Booth, the host of this thing. We got some good, good scary stuff to talk about. Gonna keep talking about the road, so sit back, relax, and uh, don't get scared. Alrighty then. Okay. But I hope everybody's having a great week. want to say thank you out there for liking my uh, podcast and liking the YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm going to try to start going live on the weekends, every weekend for a little bit. <clears throat> Just to, you know, on YouTube, I guess. Or whatever good good streaming system is. You guys let me know. Uh, good streaming system. Rago, what are you doing? Anyways, um, yeah, sorry I was yelling at the dogs. Didn't mean to yell at y'all. But, like I said, I want to say thank you to everybody listening around the world. We are getting some great download numbers. And uh, people are liking the show more and more. So keep telling your friends about it. Keep doing whatever you're doing. And um, yabba dabba do. Alright, now like I said, we got roads I'm going to cover still because it's summertime. I think after today, I'm going to research, uh, I know I'm still going to keep it on roads, but I think I'm going to try to start doing some from around the world and see. I did some of this last year, so I'll see uh, if I covered any, what roads I covered. I'll, I'll just do one section or one country at a time. I might start out with Mexico because they got, I just love their culture. And they have a lot of spooky stuff that happens down there. So, yeah. Anyways, guys, like I said, thank you very much. Hope your week is going great. And I uh, just want to say thank you out there listening. But if you're ready, I'm ready. Sit back, relax. Get you a nice warm blankie. 
and a cup of coffee or some Joe, hop cup of Jojo, and get ready to be scared. All right, that was kind of retarded. But sorry if I offended anybody with that, but uh, yeah. All right. We're going to go with our first story. Of course, you guys know I edit while I go. <laughs> Man, is this not plugged in all the way? Why is it crackling? Y'all hear that crackling? It's the cracking. The land cracking. Coming to get to me. All right. Let's start this son of a gun. All right. Our first story. What's going on? Y'all hear that too? Anyways. Our first story we're going to talk about is I-4, the dead zone in Florida. The I-4 dead zone, Florida's haunted highway. Each day, thousands of unsuspecting drivers pass over a section of highway known to locals as the uh, I-4 dead zone. That's un has this un oh unassuming quarter mile is called oh is said to be the one said to be one of the most haunted highways in the nation but like I said they say that about everything that's haunted where was I uh, I was in the nation it's the site of the failed German immigration colony in the final resting place of settlers who died during a horrific yellow fever outbreak in 1879. It's said that deadly conquests were okay con conquests were in stone for anyone who disrupted the uh, bury the burial grounds. <coughs> including the developers who paved over it to build the road and bridge that stands today. If you are planning a trip to Florida, check out our, our list of haunted places to discover. That's what they're saying if you go on the site. But we're not going to talk about everything. I'm going to get my bifocals on. Maybe turn my light on just a hair. See if that got any brighter. Oh, well, that's as bright as that one goes. Oh, well, I'll get my bifocals real quick and we'll finish up that story. Ouch. All right. There we go. I just hate wearing them because I feel like I'm in a flipping, the flipping bubble. I feel like I'm in the bubble. Okay, in 1870s, a real estate, anyways, talking about what they did up here, they uh, built something, or they bought the land and bought the burial grounds and built something over it and didn't remove the bodies or nothing. And I can kind of testify to stuff like this since when I lived in Oklahoma for about two, two and a half years. I uh, went to an Indian cemetery and that's what they were saying because I asked them I said why do they have their personal items on the uh, tombstones you know aren't they worried about people coming up here and stealing it and they said well no if they uh, it the legend goes if you take something you'll be haunted and bad shit will happen to you so if you're ever at some cemetery and there's something on some tombstone uh, leave it alone man do y'all hear that cracking too I'm sorry, I'm a perfectionist when I like my audio sounding great. Okay, so anyways, now we're going to go back to the history of the land. In the 1870s, a real estate mogul named Henry Stanford marked the southern shore of Lake Monroe to incoming immigrants and potential citrus farmers. He sold 640 acres to a group of German immigrants who founded St. Joseph. Get off. Uh, St. Joseph's Catholic Colony. Prior to this, 
the uh, area was untamed wilderness with nothing but Florida wildlife and hand in a hand operated river ferry. The land was part of a large grant owned by Henry Sanford, head of the Florida Land and Colonization Company. In 1886, a tiny railroad station was built at built at the land was uh, divided into 10 acre uh, plots to sell off to potential farmers and investors. One of these attendants uh, was a group of Catholic immigrants. Their priest Felix Swig Swigberg oversaw the settlement. According to the Central Florida Historian Colonization, efforts ended after only four families moved to the area. St. Joseph's Catholic Colony never really took off. In 1887, a yellow fever breakout sealed the fate of the land forever. This deceased killed four members of one of the families and with the rest of the colonies fearing, the, fearing that the fever was uh, contagious. The bodies of the dead were buried in the woods just north of, north of the railroad. Farther Swingenberg was called back to the area to perform the last rites of the deceased, but he never returned to the colony. Just three days after arriving in Tampa, he uh, oh he succumbed to fever, and with his death went the known location of the grave sites. Oh. <laughs> so it was their burial ground. It wasn't no ancient burial ground. Some believe that the some believe that because the people never received their last rites, their souls could not rest, and they roamed the area angry at the living. This uh, this may explain the bizarre happenings surrounding with uh, surrounding this stretch of road today. Over the years, the story is of colony becoming something of a legend. It is believed that bad luck would befall anyone who tampered with the grave sites. Locals say that a farmer's house burned to the ground and was reduced to a smoldering embers after the after he removed the grave markers. And later, a child was run down by a truck driver after he dug uh, dug around the site during play. Just enough unexplained activity was or was occurring to earn the area the grim nickname Field of Death. Hey, did y'all quit back there? Y'all are scaring me. The field was sold to the state when Florida became when Florida Florida began to purchase land to build a new highway. While the grave while the graves were intended to be moved. They were deemed inappropriate and for, uh, and forgotten. The field was paved over, and it was in the field was paved over as if it was was not a hollowed uh, ground. See, this is what happened a lot back in the day. This is not only this is the first time I've read about something like this, where these people wanting to save money and shit. We'll go out, purchase land, even though they know there's there's a cemetery there. Screw it, just move the headstones. Don't move the bodies. They won't know. And then it usually comes back to bite them in the ass because they find out about it. Soon after, when soon after when fell dirt was dumped on the site, in true Florida fashion, a hurricane ravaged the area. Hurricane Donna changed course, passing over the grave site on September 10th of 1960 and leaving a wake of destruction in uh, a wake of destruction in her way. I didn't mean to laugh like I was it's just kind of ironic that it went straight, changed directions and went straight over to the fucking um to the dang uh, grave and tore all of that up. That's just wow, crazy. The in interior of central Florida Oh, it affected the interior of Central Florida in centuries. Uh, strange enough, as it oh, so basically what they're saying is that was one of the worst storms that Central 
Central Florida has had in centuries. Strange enough as it is, but when Wilder, when, ugh, but even Wilder, weir, weirder is the fact that the hurricane followed an unexplained path. It had already crossed South Florida from the Atlantic and apparent to be heading west into the Gulf of Mexico when it, when it early, eerily changed course and followed I-4 through Central Florida. That's fuck freaking crazy. So this hurricane changed course and followed I-4. I mean, dang. That's nuts. With the eye of the storm passing over the gravesite just around midnight, many locals believe that the highway construction tampering with the dead caused the path of the path of Donna. In 2004, another hurricane named Charlie took the same route as Donna and passed over the gravesites. Unsurprisingly, construction work was uh, happening around the uh, gravesite when the hurricane arrived. This was just the beginning of eerie legacy of the dead zone. That's crazy. Anytime they try to build on there or get it built back up, a freaking hurricane comes. Well, I don't think I would uh, buy that land and build crap on it. If I was the state of Florida, I'd buy it, put a, put a fence around it so no one can build on it. Ever. The Interstate 4 Highway is a 132-mile freeway that runs through Florida. Between Daytona Beach and Orlando, Orlando lies the dead zone, located at St. John's River. Drivers and visitors to the I-45 dead zone tell of strange uh, occurrences as they pass over the specific stretch of road. Cell phones are known to pick up voices at the south end of uh, I-4 Bridge in Seminole County. One witness reported that that if you're talking with someone on the phone, the conversation will be interrupted by voices of the dead. Crazy. The section of the road, this section or the section of the road is also infamous for an unexplained amount of deadly car accidents. On the day that the interstate was open for traffic, a truck calling frozen shrimp was the dead zone's first casualty. It lost control and jackknife right above the gravesite. Oh my god. Frequent uh, deadly accidents are believed to be caused by the spirits of the dead buried beneath the cold uh, cement of the highway. <laughs> Excuse me, because of hiccups. Other unexplained events include random static on CB radios, cell phones turning off, turning off on their own, wispy balls of light uh, flittering above the road, ghost, a ghostly hitchhiker, and phenom, phenom voices and apparitions. You see it all there. What's causing all of this? Could it be a case of uh, immigration of the? Could it be a case of your? That's Stephanie. Your imagination uh, running wild, or is it something more sinister? That's just the dogs. Locals swear that these events are caused by nothing more than secret. Secret buried just beneath the asphalt. Hey, keep it down. I'm recording. I told you. Sorry about that. These dang doe kids. All right. We're getting back with the story. Sorry about that. Kids came home. I had to stop. 
So if you are ever traveling in Florida and find yourself unlucky enough to be passing through the I-4 dead zone, be sure to use caution and look twice before changing lanes. You may even see something in your mirrors that you'll never forget. That's some crazy stuff. I might have to read that story on my other podcast. I do that sometimes. I take some of these stories and put them on that one. It's my adult podcast. It's only for the adults, not the kids. All right. I'm going to get a drink. God. God damn it! These guys are, I'm sorry about the cut, 